Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Affairs and the Subcommittee on Government Operations will come to order. Without objection, the presiding member is authorized to declare recess at any time. <clears throat> Today's hearing marks the 10th anniversary of the Troubled Asset Relief Program, also known as TARP. Since 2009, this committee has conducted oversight of TARP programs and management. TARP was created in 2008 in the aftermath of the nation's worst economic recession in modern history. Often referred to as the Bank Bailout Program, TARP was a $400 billion program intended to stabilize the U.S. financial system and preserve home ownership. In 2010, the Treasury Department created the TARP program known as the Hardest Hit Fund to mitigate the impact of ha the housing crisis <clears throat> and to prevent foreclosures. The Hardest Hit Fund allocates up to $9.6 billion in TARP funds for locally tailored aid to 19 participating state housing finance agencies through 2020. Early in the program's tenure, the Government Accountability Office and the Special Inspector for TARP issued reports on state impl implementation challenges and the program's lack of established merits and goals. In 2017, the Office of the Special Investigator General of TARP, or SIG TARP, issued a report questioning $3 million in administrative expenses charged by state housing finance agencies. Such expenses included bonuses, barbecues, gym memberships, severance payments, trips to the zoo, and other perks funded by federal TARP dollars through the Hardest Hit Fund. <clears throat> the Treasury Department determined approximately 70 percent of these expenses are allowable under the terms of its participation agreement with the states. In other words, less than 30 percent of the $3 million uh, questioned by SIGTARP was deemed recoverable by Treasury. It is the duty of federal and state partners to ensure that taxpayer dollars for federally funded state administered programs are used for their intended purposes. None of the payments identified by SIGTARP's report advance the main purpose of the program, to prevent foreclosure and provide assistance to homeowners most affected by the housing crisis. Although many states have, according to Treasury, voluntarily refunded over $450,000 to the program since SIGTARP's report, it is apparent that the questions over appropriate expenditures and, and program efficiencies remain. According to SIGTARP's 2017 semiannual report to Congress, fewer than half of all homeowners who sought assistance were admitted to the program, and nearly 30 percent of homeowners withdrew their applications. With nearly $2 billion in remaining funds left to be dis disbursed by the Treasury to the states, it is necessary to ensure proper safeguards are in place. I thank the witnesses from the Treasury Department, SIGTARP, and the representatives from three states, including my home state of Alabama, for being here today. I now recognize the ranking member of the Intergovernmental Affairs Subcommittee, Mr. Rans uh, Raskin, for five minutes for his opening statement. I Chairman Palmer, Chairman Meadows, thanks so much for calling today's hearing, and I want to thank all the witnesses for coming. The Hardest Hit Program was set up to provide targeted aid to families uh, in states that were decimated by the downturn of the housing markets, funded by the feds but administered by state governments. The Hardest Hit Fund has financed mortgage modification, unemployment assistance, transition assistance, mortgage reinstatement, and blight elimination. Since 2010, when it was created, the fund has assisted over 350,000 families and removed 24,000 blighted properties in 18 states and D.C. So I don't want to understate the contributions it's made. But although it's helped many people avoid losing their homes, um, the diligent work of the Special Inspector General for TARP has provoked a lot of bipartisan anxiety about how state agencies are administering the program. And I have a number of profound concerns that I look forward to addressing today. The first is why uh, my state, Maryland, and other states where people were hit very hard during the financial crisis were excluded completely from the hardest hit fund. It's been very tough for me to read uh, reports about uh, scandalous abuses of the program, waste of money taking place, um, feather bedding and uh, the bloated budgets, while my state was completely excluded from it. And I would like somebody to explain that to me. Why did the Treasury Department exclude Maryland? Um, in addition, um, why do we still have no analysis from Treasury about the success and potential expansion of the program now seven years into it. While states in need like mine received zero dollars under the program, others received many millions of dollars that ended up going to fund excessive and egregious uh, wasteful expenditures that were uncovered in the audits. 
Um, and so we, I want to know, along with the chairman, why did all of this money go, and why is this money going to lavish catered barbecue parties, visa gift cards, employee bonuses, catered lunches with Treasury employees, uh, fancy cars, and employee trips to the zoo? Uh, now, I know a lot of states did not break the rules in any way. The California Hardest Hit Fund program seems to have the highest rate of homeowner approval with over 73,000 Americans that have been assisted with apparently no wasteful expenditures reported. Um, so I look forward today uh, into our digging into the work of the Special Inspector General and her team uh, at SIGTARP who uncovered the fact that federal dollars meant to help people recovering from the greatest economic catastrophe since the Depression were being wasted on things like a car allowance of $11,000 for a Mercedes-Benz uh, for a CEO. Uh, a September SIGTARP audit report found that the Nevada Affordable Housing Assistance Corporation misspent $8.2 million. In 2017, Treasury reported to SIGTARP that Nevada's HHF did not meet its utilization threshold and will have its allocation reduced by $6.7 million. Nevada was the only state participating in the program to have funds cut. Um, the Georgia Department of Community Affairs provided hardest hit funds to only 9,000 homeowners and rejected two-thirds of the applicants. So, um, Mr. Chairman, there's a lot of questions here that I want us to get to the bottom of today, and I, I thank you for calling this hearing. I now recognize the chairman of the uh, Subcommittee on Government Operations, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Uh, Inspector General uh, Romero, thank you so much for being here. It, it was a pleasure to not only visit uh, you know, your workplace with so many dedicated individuals, but see your leadership, and I just wanted to go on record to recognize that, and thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Farmer, uh, welcome. Uh, you know, this isn't Raleigh. Uh, actually, if we could operate D.C. as well as we do Raleigh, we might be in a better uh, position. But I, I want to just say welcome. I, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, your thoughtful uh, insight on some of the issues that uh, we may be talking about today in terms of your proactive stance there. I want to acknowledge that and thank you. And then my good friend, Mr. Oglesby, who's uh, actually in the audience, Bill is a constituent. And so I, I want to uh, thank him for his advocacy on this particular area. And as we look at all of this, this is all about being accountable uh, for the hardworking American taxpayer dollar and, and making sure that those priorities go and are, are invested in those areas that best help those that are in need. And so as we look at that, it's critically important that we do that. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your leadership on this particular area, and I will yield back. I now recognize the ranking member of the uh, Government Operations Subcommittee, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Mr. Meadows for calling today's hearing to look into mismanagement and wasteful spending in the hardest hit program. And thanks to our witnesses for being here. The Oversight and Government Reform Committee has broad jurisdiction to look into fraud, waste, and abuse throughout the government including when federal dollars go to state and local governments or other recipients. Taxpayer dollars should not be viewed as a slush fund, and I welcome the committee's oversight into this issue today. To ensure accountability wherever taxpayer dollars are spent, it's also important that this committee look into wasteful spending elsewhere in the federal government. I would welcome a deeper look into wasteful spending at the Environmental Protection Agency, for example. $43,000 on a soundproof booth uh, for Administrator Scott Pruitt in violation of spending laws. $105,000 on Administrator Pruitt's first class flights in the first year on the job. $100,000 for a four day trip to Moscow. $120,000 on a four day trip to Italy. $45,000 for EPA aides to fly to Australia and prepare for yet another trip that had to be canceled because of Hurricane Harvey. Five-figure salary increases for preferred staff, even after the White House Office of Personnel denied the request. This is not to mention Administrator Pruitt's ethical challenges, including his cozy relationship 
with lobbyists for the industries regulated by the EPA. This committee should also look into how the Department of Interior was able to spend $139,000 on new doors for Secretary Zinke's office, which makes the $31,000 dining set at the Department of Housing and Urban Development look like small potatoes. And this is just what we know from publicly reported expenditures. I'm sure if the committee took on a full-fledged and vigorous investigation into the wasteful spending by the Trump cabinet, we'd be able to find other examples of the flagrant misuse of taxpayer dollars. Ten years ago, a financial crisis hit the American people, the likes of which were unseen since the Great Depression. Housing prices plunged. 8.8 .8 million jobs were lost. A liquidity crisis hit the financial sector and the unemployment rate hit 10 percent. The meltdown left hundreds of thousands of homeowners underwater in their mortgages, owing more than their houses were worth. In 2008, U.S. foreclosure filings spiked more than 81 percent, and over 860,000 families lost their homes in foreclosures that year alone. In response to this crisis, Congress enacted the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, which, among other things, created the TARP Troubled Asset Relief Program. TARP is widely considered a bank bailout, authorizing the Secretary of the Treasury either to purchase or insure up to $700 billion in troubled assets owned by financial firms. TARP also sought to provide assistance to homeowners facing foreclosure by stabilizing housing markets and engaging in foreclosure mitigation through the Home Affordable Modification Program the Federal Housing Administration Short Refinance Program, and the Hardest Hit Fund. The Hardest Hit Fund made funding available to the state housing finance agencies that had experienced the greatest declines in home prices. The program has helped homeowners stay in their houses and knock down blighted properties, raising property values of the surrounding homes. It's grown into a $9.6 billion program funded by the federal government, but administered by the states and has assisted more than 300,000 homeowners in 18 states and the District of Columbia. I support the cooperative federalism embedded in this program with the states and the federal government working together to solve common problems. But today's hearing will highlight instances where that cooperative federalism has gone awry. A number of hardest hit fund partner states severely mismanaged their programs and or misspent federal funds. In September of 2016, the Special Inspector General for TARP found that the Nevada Housing Division allowed abuse and waste of $8.2 million in hardest hit fund dollars instead of helping homeowners who were facing foreclosure. This included a car allowance of $500 a month for the CEO to drive a Mercedes Benz, totaling $11,000. Nearly the same amount of money was spent on employee bonuses, gifts, outings, and other perks. Over 5,800 spent on holiday parties and gifts, 43,000 in bonuses, almost all of which were paid to a CEO who was later terminated. At the same time, the state agency had all but stopped homeowners from getting assistance through the hardest hit fund, admitting only 117 Nevada homeowners in 2015, a year on year drop of 96 percent. The Special Objective, uh, Inspector General for TARP also found that state agencies charged more than 100,000 for barbecues, picnics, celebrations, and other outings that included food and beverage. Instead of putting $14,124 toward assisting homeowners, the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency charged that amount for employee food and beverages. Overall, SIGTARP found that the agency charged more than $100,000 in unnecessary expenses. At the same time, that same agency denied 18.8 percent of homeowners who applied for housing assistance. State agencies even charged employee parking fees at the hardest hit fund, as was the case in Michigan, which spent over $330,000 for that purpose. Eight years after passage of TARP, the Special Inspector General for TARP continues to conduct audits of the hardest hit fund expenditures to ensure that money is spent properly. On August 2017, uh, SIGTRAP found that the states had misspent $3 million in TARP funds. We must remember that's $3 million which could have been used 
to provide mortgage assistance to underwater homeowners or to rehabilitate neighborhoods. The only thing more disappointing than state agencies using money meant to help homeowners on unnecessary expenditures is the Treasury Department's reluctance to recover those misspent taxpayer dollars. After receiving SIGTARP's audit, Treasury decided to claw back only 29 percent of the improperly spent funds. So long as TARP programs exist, it's important that SIGTARP keep a watchful eye on those expenditures to ensure the taxpayer dollars are spent judiciously and for the purpose of which Congress intended. I'm glad we're having this hearing. I'm glad we're looking at the improper use and expenditure of funds. But I believe the same standard ought to be applied to the Trump cabinet, and this committee should have hearings on those issues that are just as important to the American public. I yield back. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Kip Cranbull, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Small Business, Community Development, and Affordable Housing Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Does all that fit on one business card? The Honorable Christy Goldsmith Romero, Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Ms. Varese Campbell, Chief Executive Officer of the Nevada Affordable Housing Assistance Corporation. Ms. Kathy James, Business Development Manager at the Alabama Housing Finance Authority, and Mr. Scott Farmer, Executive Director of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. Welcome uh, to you all. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify, so please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? The record will reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. As a reminder, the clock in front of you shows the remaining time during your opening statement. The light will turn yellow. It's kind of like a, a yellow light at a traffic stop. It means speed up. Uh, you have 30 seconds left and, and red when your time is up. Please also remember to press the button to turn your microphone on before speaking. Uh, Mr. Cramble, we'll look forward to your testimony. Chairman Meadows, Chairman Palmer, Ranking Member Connolly, Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about Treasury's efforts to mitigate the effects of the financial crisis on American homeowners through the Hardest Hit Fund, or HHF. Treasury established HHF in 2010 as a part of the Troubled Assets Relief Program, or TARP, in order to help prevent foreclosure and to stabilize housing markets in states hit hardest by the housing crisis. State housing finance agencies, or HFAs, in 18 states in the District of Columbia were selected to participate as these areas experience unemployment rates at or above the national average and or home price declines of greater than 20 percent. HHF was, des was designed to give the participating HFAs the maximum flexibility to design and administer their own programs, each tailored to local conditions in their respective communities. As a part of this flexibility, the states have been able to adapt their programs in order to address the changing needs in their communities over time. As of December 31, 2017, states had assisted approximately 350,000 homeowners and funded the demolition and greening of nearly 24,000 blighted properties in distressed communities. However, the flexibility afforded to HFAs by the Hardest Hit Fund has made Treasury's oversight a critical aspect of the program. Treasury remains a strong, maintains a strong commitment to ensure that the program achieves its goals and that federal taxpayer dollars are used for their intended purpose. Treasury requires each HFA to set specific goals for its HHF program and to demonstrate steady progress towards meeting these goals. Treasury also maintains an ongoing dialogue and works with each of the HFAs to identify and address barriers that would keep the HFA from achieving its goals. Treasury has also conducted more than 100 on-site compliance reviews across the participating HFAs, as well as additional targeted reviews to address specific programmatic risks. These reviews evaluate a number of critical program functions, such as whether the homeowners are evaluated in accordance with the HFA's guidelines, program disbursements and administrative expenditures are appropriate, the information reported to Treasury is accurate, and the HFA's internal controls are functioning as intended to minimize the risk of noncompliance. Treasury takes corrective action when instances of noncompliance arise. This includes, for example, requiring the HFA's to reevaluate homeowners that were improperly denied, to reimburse HHF for improper expenditures, and to strengthen internal controls in order to prevent further noncompliance. In addition to compliance reviews, 
Treasury also shares this committee and SIGTARP's commitment to preventing fraud, waste, and abuse in all TARP programs, and we certainly consider the recommendations in that, in the, in that regard. Treasury responds to SIGTARP recommendations in writing, and our responses are made available to the public. We work hard to address the concerns raised by these recommendations in a manner that allows the programs to function as intended and in the context of TARP's wind down. For example, Treasury thoroughly reviewed the $2.2 million of cost questions in SIGTARP's August 2017 report. This involved analyzing thousands of individual transactions incurred by all 19 HFAs dating back to the program's inception in 2010. Following this review, Treasury determined that $656,141 of the question cost did not comply with federal government's cost principles. The HFAs were required to reimburse HHF. For the reasons set forth in our April 6, 2018 letter to SIGTARP, a copy of which has been provided to the committee and is available on our website, Treasury determined that the remaining costs questioned by SIGTARP were allowable under federal cost principles. As is the case with all TARP programs, HHF is winding down. Although Congress authorized additional funding in 2015, the program remains a temporary one. As of the end of April 2018, Treasury has dispersed $8.8 billion, or 92 percent, of the $9.6 billion obligated under HHF. Although HFAs may continue issuing new approvals through December 31, 2020, most of the states have already begun to close down HHF programs or, or will do so this year as they exhaust their available funds. This includes California and Florida, the two largest states in the program. Treasury's outstanding commitments under TARP represent just 1 percent of the $475 billion authorized by Congress. As TARP winds down, Treasury remains committed to robust oversight and monitoring of all of its TARP programs, including HHF. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and welcome your questions. Thank the gentleman for his testimony. The chair recognizes Ms. Romero for her testimony. Chairman Palmer and Chairman Meadows and Ranking Member Raskin, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the committee, I really thank you for the support that you've given to SIGTARP. SIGTARP is a law enforcement agency as well as a watchdog auditor. 415 defendants we investigated have been charged with crimes, including 100 bankers. 349 have already been convicted, 247 sentenced to prison. We've recovered $10 billion from our investigations. That's money going back to the government, to victims, to homeowners. That's a 35 times return on investment on our budget. SIGTARP auditors have uh, identified hundreds of millions of dollars in waste, question costs, cost savings. So I'm grateful that you're examining the hardest hit fund because I've been there for the full eight years of the program. At the very beginning of the program, Phyllis Caldwell, who's the senior treasury official who created the program, said to SIGTARP that, that what they were trying to do at Treasury was develop locally tailored strategies. And she explained this to us as state agencies choose the type of program, the amount of funding, the number of homeowners that they want to help. The White House announced that the program would be under strict transparency and accountability rules, and Treasury promised that they would measure performance. And Phyllis Caldwell told us that meant, are we reaching the right number of people? Are the states meeting their targets? If not, we'll learn and we'll adjust. By 2012, we found Treasury had moved away from that. The senior Treasury official who was in charge of implementing the program told SIGTARP, this is not our program, this is their program. After two years, at the height of the recession, only 3 percent of the money had gone out to only 7 percent of the homeowners who were, the program was estimated to help. Treasury has never took ownership of this program or brought accountability. We made bread and butter IG practices, recommendations for best practices that were often dismissed. Some state agencies performed well. And so for low-performing state agencies, what we did was we did data analytics. We talked to homeowners. We talked to whistleblowers. We talked to housing counselors and others. We identified obstacles that could be removed. For example, in Florida, seniors had trouble with online applications. That's not surprising. Or trouble getting documents such as tax assessments. In Georgia, homeowners had trouble because they had to go to the IRS and get a tax transcript within 30 days, which you can't do and which state, other state agencies don't require. After our reports, some of these obstacles were removed and the performance improved. We found waste and, and misused dollars, which you've already talked about. Parties, picnics, catered barbecues, gifts, steak and seafood dinners, $500 a month for an executive to drive a Mercedes? 
I found one receipt in Illinois, $549 at a pizza restaurant, and it said to celebrate uh, HHF funds officially given from U.S. Treasury and to celebrate a, a, the name of employee's upcoming wedding. In comparison, Arizona and California, which has the most dollars, spend zero dollars on food and parties. We applied Treasury's contract criteria. In 2010, Treasury's top lawyer said that under appropriations law, an expense must be necessary to what Congress authorized in TARP. And if a homeowner could get this assistance without it, it wasn't necessary. Well, the federal cost principles that have been talked about today start with necessary, next reasonable, next allocable to the program. And that top lawyer at Treasury warned that if you open this up farther, it's going to uh, authorize an almost unlimited number and variety of expenditures, rendering the TARP law meaningless. And that's what we found days at the zoo and gym memberships and lawyers' fees to settle discrimination claims and visa gift cards, custom shirts, building a customer center where most of the customers are not hardest hit fund, moving into a luxury building, $20,000 severance package. But ultimately, every misused dollar is one less dollar for homeowners or to reduce the cost. We found that there were no federal competition requirements that could save money and prevent fraud. We found that blight demolition rose 90% in Michigan, 65% in Ohio, 70% in Indiana. Army Corps of Engineers found asbestos mismanaged. So what are the top threats today in the program? Waste, anti-competitive conduct. In the blight uh, program, corruption, fraud, antitrust, asbestos exposure. These are the types of areas we are investigating and auditing, so we have a vested interest in prevention. Greater accountabilities and controls are needed. There are billions of dollars at stake. More than 100,000 people applied for this program this year. Demolitions are just starting this year or haven't even started in some cities, so it's not too late. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Campbell for her testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Palmer, Chairman Meadows, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and appear before you regarding implementation and oversight of the Hardest Hit Fund. For the record, my name is Varese Campbell, and since June of 2016, I've been the Chief Executive Officer for the Nevada Affordable Assistance Corporation, also known as NAHAC. I was selected by the state of Nevada to restructure NAHAC after the organization experienced a series of operational issues and a decrease in production. No state was hit harder than Nevada during the Great Recession and subsequent housing crisis, and the Nevada Hardest Hit Fund has been instrumental in helping people save their homes and get back on their feet. These are actual quotes from some of our homeowners. This program saved my life. It saved my children's life. I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off of my shoulders. We were under so much pressure, we didn't know what to do. We thought we were going to lose our home until we spoke to the hardest hit. Providing benefits to Nevada homeowners has not been without challenges. NAHAC acknowledges that there have been issues with its performance. Specifically, the most critical report was the SIGTARP report that actually indicated that there was fraud, waste, and abuse in Nevada in the amount of $8.2 million. However, subsequent Treasury audits for the same period found a significantly reduced amount of unallowable expenses, $136,000, not $8.2 million. NAHAC immediately reimbursed the $136,000 to Treasury. Nevertheless, it was without a doubt changes had to be made if NAHAC was going to effectively serve Nevada homeowners. Major changes were in fact made to NAHAC's organizational structure, systems, and programs. In fact, our newest program is a down payment assistance program entitled Hope Brings You Home, which was launched on May 1st, 2018. $36 million was allocated to this program to assist 1,800 homeowners. To date, the Down Payment Assistance Program has over 200 reservations with over $3.8 million committed in its short time. The Nevada Affordable Housing Assistance Corporation has helped over 5,000, almost 6,000 Nevada households to date, and that number continues to grow. Programs have been instituted to solve Nevada's housing crisis with the assistance of Treasury, Nevada's Business and Industry, and the Nevada Housing Division. NAHAC initially 
but there were issues with the operations of NAHAC initially, but NAHAC has improved its organizational structure and its operations, resulting in better oversight, transparency, and controls, and increased capacity to help more Nevada families. New management is committed to efficiently and effectively utilize the remaining allocation of government funds to help more citizens of one of the hardest hit states stay in their homes and stabilize Nevada's housing markets. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Ms. James for her testimony. Five minutes. Good morning. Chairman Palmer, Chairman Meadows, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for the invitation to discuss with you Alabama's Hardest Hit Program. My name is Kathy James. I'm the Business Development Manager for Alabama Housing Finance Authority. I also serve as a manager of the Hardest Hit Funds Program in Alabama, which we call the Hardest Hit Alabama Program. Alabama's introduction to the Hardest Hit Fund began with the notification in 2010. Hardest hit funds had already undergone two rounds of funding when AHFA was invited to participate in round three. We quickly began creating our program and program guidelines. We began by reviewing term sheet templates that were furnished to us by the Department of Treasury, which had been adopted by other states in rounds one and two. During the de development of our process, close attention was paid to the respective allocations of program funds and administrative expenses. In total, Alabama's allocation is $162.5 million, and 16.75% is allocated to administrative expenses. During the seven years of hardest hit assistance, the Department of Treasury has approved 12 term sheet changes for the state of Alabama. Our current portfolio of programs includes a mortgage payment assistance program, a loan modification program, a short sale program, and a blight elimination pilot program. More than 6,500 homeowners have been approved and received more than $63.8 million in program dollars. We have an average of $9,828 per household for assistance. 85% of the households who received assistance in our mortgage payment assistance program had an annual income of $50,000 or less. 45% of the homeowners who received assistance were 90 plus days delinquent on their first mortgage at the time of application. And hardest hit funds have been dispersed in all 67 counties in the state of Alabama. AHFA undertakes the administration of the hardest hit funds program with great seriousness. To ensure regulatory and program compliance, Alabama's hardest hit program is reviewed on a monthly basis by our internal audit team, an annual basis by an independent audit firm, and since the program's inception, Alabama has completed five compliance reviews with the Department of Treasury. The 2017 SIGTARP report asserted that $705 of expenses charged by AHFA to the hardest hit fund was unreasonable and therefore unallowable. All noted expenses were related to hardest hit activities, such as in-house lunches for working conferences, in one instance lunch with a servicer participating in the hardest hit funds program, and promotional items to two homeowners who volunteered for radio and television ads. Alabama contested the allegations and defended the charges. Even so, per the March 2018 compliance review, AHFA agreed to reimburse Treasury $397. The balance of expenses were found to be reasonable. Since notification of Alabama's allocation of hardest hit funds, we have worked to ensure that the program is programmatically sound and funds were not spent unnecessarily. AHFA's commitment to the proper use of hardest hit funds is unchanged. We will continue to provide hardest hit assistance to homeowners across the state of Alabama in compliance with the agreed upon terms in the term sheets and in compliance with federal guidelines. Thank you. Chair now recognize Mr. Farmer for his questions for five minutes. Chairman Meadows, Chairman Palmer, and honorable members of the committee, my name is Scott Farmer and I'm the executive director of the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. Since January of 2017, it has been my honor to serve as executive director, and I'm proud to be with you today representing our board of directors and more than 160 dedicated staff. Thank you for the opportunity to share information about one of our most effective programs, the NC Foreclosure Prevention Fund, and its accomplishments on behalf of citizens in danger of losing their homes in the face of a significant economic downturn. 
The NC Foreclosure Prevention Fund helps responsible North Carolina homeowners struggling with mortgage payments while they search for work or retrain for a new career. Eligible homeowners include those facing foreclosure due to a no-fault job loss, reduction of income, or temporary financial hardship such as illness, death of a spouse, or a natural disaster. The fund also provides housing counseling and assistance to veterans who are transitioning to civilian life. Veterans who have given so much in service to our nation should never face the prospect of losing their home. This initiative has already saved more than 400 veteran fam families from losing their homes. The fund was launched in 2010 in the wake of the Great Recession when our state was identified by Treasury as hardest hit due to high unemployment and a high number of foreclosure filings. Since then, the fund has helped more than 26,000 homeowners keep their homes during difficult times. Approximately $706 million was allocated to our agency under the Hardest Hit Fund. To develop this program, we had to significantly expand our agency capacity. This included hiring more staff, leasing additional office space, building a complex application portal and website, and training hundreds of partners statewide. We were notified by Treasury that we were to receive hardest hit funds in April of 2010. The initial program was approved by Treasury in August of 2010, and we built, marketed, and implemented the program by October in only six months. Standing up a program of this scale and complexity in that time frame required long hours for staff, many of whom already had existing full-time workloads within our agency. The work is specialized, involved, and stressful when assisting homeowners who were understandably upset at potentially losing their homes. Among the thousands of hardworking families assisted by the fund is a small business owner in Allegheny County who has owned a thriving business since 1998. That changed when the recession hit, and by 2011, he and his wife were about to lose their home. Our assistance enabled them to hold on to their home, and I am pleased to report their business emerged from the recession stronger and recently celebrated its 20th anniversary. The fund also helped a Lee County veteran who struggled to find employment after his discharge from the U.S. Army. The assistants kept his family in their home while he used the GI Bill to acquire skills he needed for a civilian job. He is now employed by a local government. A worker in Buncombe County who was laid off from her job was able to keep her home with assistance from the fund while she sought, sought new employment. She still lives in her home and now works for a healthcare nonprofit that focuses on providing medical care for underserved rural communities. The fund has also had a noteworthy impact on state and local economies. It has preserved an estimated $4.5 billion in property values, sustaining wealth not only for the homeowners we assisted, but for their neighbors as well. On average, lenders and investors can expect to lose almost half of their investment in a foreclosed mortgage. Foreclosures prevented by our work have saved an estimated $1.5 billion in our state. This work also offsets the costs associated with broader social impacts of foreclosure, such as familial stress, neighborhood destabilization, crime, and degraded health outcomes. As noted, we have helped more than 26,000 North Carolinians in the nearly eight years since the program was launched, using a significant portion of the allocated hardest hit funds. We are currently winding down the program and expect to have committed all of our program funds by the second quarter of 2019. We are proud of what has been accomplished for North Carolina and its citizens through the NC Foreclosure Prevention Fund, and we will continue to ensure that eligible homeowners have the opportunity to benefit from this program. Thank you for the opportunity to share our story today, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank witnesses for their testimony. I, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes for his questions. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this very important hearing. Uh, Ms. Romero, you uh, listed a very impressive uh, record for your uh, office, uh, but uh, you also said that uh, uh, Nevada, for instance, had, had um, committed 8.2 million, uh, or lost 8.2 million in waste, fraud, or abuse, and then Ms. Campbell just turned right beside you and said, oh, it was only 136,000. What? Uh, what is the discrepancy there? Or what do you think about her statement about that none of it really was waste, fraud, and abuse, or very little? Uh, so it wasn't, I, I, we didn't label it as fraud, we labeled it as waste and abuse. I want to make that uh, distinction clear because it was our auditors, but uh, it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, to be honest, she, what, 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 what NAHAC paid back was what Treasury requested, which also didn't make sense. So, for example, the CEO that was driving the Mercedes Ben was Benz was forced to resign. He got a twenty thousand dollars severance package, and that's been paid. 
that that's not necessary for a homeowner to get assistance in the hardest hit fund. So what I found was that Treasury uh, officials were applying the wrong standards. They were not applying the necessary standard, which is the not only what's baked into their contracts, but is the first requirement of, of, uh, of the federal cost principles, nor is it reasonable. That's just one example. There, there, are, there are many, many examples, like moving into a luxury building to improve employee morale, uh, then deciding it's, it's more cost than you need because you doubled the rent, breaking the lease, uh, $20,000 in legal fees to break the lease and move and pay rent. None of that was paid back. And this was all at a time when they really weren't helping homeowners get this money out to homeowners. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the report uh, says that as of December 2017, 347,000 people had been helped by this uh, HHF program. Uh, can uh, uh, somebody tell me how this works exactly? Uh, uh, what, uh, have some of these, uh, how many homes is that? In other words, uh, uh, most homes are in the name of the husband and wife both or, or maybe more than one person. So h how many homes are we talking about? Does anybody know of the 347,000? Mr. Mr. Committee Member of Reese yes. Campbell from Nevada, we count households, so those numbers represent the household. So one. those are 347,000 homes then? Households. Not, all right, and and how long can somebody stay on this program? Uh, the, the, uh, Ms. Romero mentioned it's uh, eight years um, old. Um, uh, how how long can has have there been people that have been on this program from day one and they're still on the program? Can anybody tell me? This is Kathy with Alabama Housing Finance Authority. I think that each state is a little bit different, but for the state of Alabama, for the Mortgage Payment Assistance Program, our homeowners have up to 12 months, not to exceed $30,000. And is that, is that pretty typical? Uh, uh, you say each state is different, uh, Ms. Campbell? Um, Mr. Committee Member, our homeowners, it depends on the program. We have an unemployment program where a homeowner can stay on the program up to 18 months. And we have a limit for all of our programs combined, no more than $100,000 per household. All right. Is that, uh, is that typical, uh, Ms. Romero? Again, it varies two years, three years, one year. Just depends on the state. All right. And, and now, uh, Mr. Cranbill, uh, it says there's two billion unspent. Is that correct in, in one of these reports? It's at actually around eight, 800 million. The two billion was the new authorization in round five from the uh, 2015 vote for starting in 2016 could be spent through 2021. So there's about 800,000 left or about 8% of the hardest hit funds remain available. Is there a goal or a plan to uh, since since the since unemployment is now so low and the economy is so strong, is there a plan to end this program or phase it out? Uh, yes, sir. This program, the applications are available for the um, those who have have dollars that that, that two million that or, sorry two billion was um, allocated right. across the 19 states. So of the remaining funds, that applications may be accepted through December 31st of. 2020 and dollars can be put out through December 31st, 2020, if there are any remaining dollars. Certain states have already wound those down, so there are no, do no longer dollars available. So how many of the 19 states have they have wound down the program? Uh, California and uh, Florida are already uh, wound down, or the final stages of winding down. Others are, many of the others are, are initiating that wind down now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we'll go for the, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll yield to Mr. Connolly and switch places with him if that's okay. So moved. Thank I thank Mr. the Connelly. chair and I thank my good friend from Maryland. I have a hearing and markup of foreign affairs, so I appreciate his consideration and, and gracefulness. Um, I'm concerned about the apparent mismanagement of the hardest hit fund program by some of our partner states. According to the Special uh, Inspector General's report, 
State spent over $600,000 on cars for executives, free parking for staff, and monthly parking bus passes. States also spent $50,000 on events with housing counselors, $14,000 for employee meals, and $8,000 on gym memberships. In 2017, the SIGTARP found nearly $3 million in such wasteful spending. Mr. Cranbull, where in the world did the states get the idea that this was permissible spending? Well, I, I can't, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, ranking Member, I appreciate your question. I, I can't speak for why the states make decisions they make, but they are required to follow federal cost principles in all of their administrative expenses, and um, that is the, the standard that is they're required to follow. Well, I mean, okay, but some of them decided based on those uh, standards that it was permissible to spend up to $8,000 in gym memberships using federal funds that were intended for housing relief. How could that happen? Was there any oversight by the Department of Treasury with respect to the use of these funds? Uh, we have, we have conducted more than 100 in-person reviews. And on I'm sorry? We, the Treasury Department has conducted uh, more than 100 in-person reviews uh, uh, with the states to review their administrative expenses. We work with them up front to make sure that there are uh, standards followed, that there are cost principles are, um, and, and um, compliance platforms are, are very clear. And we review those with them on the phone frequently if there is any instance. Well, well, let me ask it differently. I mean, I, I get all that. We'll stipulate all that. But the fact is somebody spent money on gym memberships. Does that meet with your approval? Did that meet with your standards? There are uh, a range of, of uh, expenses that are uh, eligible and ineligible under federal cost principles. Is gym membership ineligible or eligible? Sir, if you'd like to go through each line item, I'd uh, be happy to meet with you and your staff. No, sir, I have a simple question in a public hearing. Is a gym membership payment a permissible use of these funds from your point of view? Um, well, sir, I can't, uh, all I can tell you is that the federal cost principles are followed and under certain circumstances. Oh, for God's wellness sake. Programs Ms. Romero, is, is permissible or not? Since apparently Mr. Cranbull doesn't want to answer a reasonable question put to him that's pretty simple. No. I mean, no. Thank you so much, Ms. No. Romero. That's called declarative English. Useful thing when we're trying to get to the bottom of problems. Can you elaborate, since Mr. Cranbull wants to give us, read us, you know, strictures from a manual somewhere? Uh, Treasury uh, sent me a letter in, in April saying that they, they did think that gym memberships um, were allowed in the federal cost principles. Number one of the federal cost principles got to be necessary to what Congress authorized. So unless the only way I can reach an agreement with a homeowner is at the gym, it wouldn't be a permissible expense. No, and I think that raises a real danger of what could be allowed. Right. Well, in listening to Mr. Cranbull's convoluted answer, it, right here, right now, I've got more concerns than I had going into this hearing because apparently we're not clear. Um, and no wonder states are, uh, you know, approving expenditures that clearly to any common sense witness would not be allowable because of this kind of fuzzy guidance. Um, the Treasury Department, Ms. Romero, since Mr. Kremble is not going to be cooperative in answering, um, I'll ask you. The Treasury Department only sought to recuperate 29 percent of the money that was misspent or wasted is that acceptable from your point of view, and why only 29%? No, it's not acceptable. Uh, you know, we worked hard to look at this. We didn't put, we didn't substitute our own judgment. We, we applied the federal cost principles. We are, you know, there's a long history of applying the federal cost principles. They apply to every grant. This is just standard IG work, so no, it's not acceptable. And I also want to say, when, when he says this program's in wind down or that there's not $2 billion, there is $2 billion remaining to be spent. The numbers that he's talking about is what's gone out of Treasury's door, but it's not been spent. So when he says California's closing down, California has 300 and 300, $334 million to be spent. Very helpful. Thank you, and thanks for the declarative answers. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Conley. I will take a few minutes to uh, follow up with some questions and then uh, yield some time to Mr. Raskin um, 
What actions, if any, did your agency, Mr. Farmer, take to address the concerns raised in the Special Inspector General for TARP's report? Yes, thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately following the release of the report, um, our agency made the decision to repay uh, a portion of those um, costs related to meals, primarily because you know, there was a number of charges in there that we could have spent uh, an inordinate amount of time debating back and forth whether or not it was um, allowed or not allowed. So we decided to repay the meals immediately. Uh, in addition to that, we hired a third party audit firm um, to bring, we brought them into our office, had them look at the expenses, look at the categories and how we were categorizing expenses to give us advice to uh, help us address um, any questions related to those expenses highlighted in the report. Uh, in addition to that, we also revised our travel and expense policies based on that guidance. Um, in addition to that, we also provided all of the same records to Treasury. They did a similar review. Um, while you know we, we did not agree with everything that was included in the initial report and the categorization of some of the categories, we, we respect the role and responsibilities of SIGTARP in reviewing it. And so we tried to get back to the place where we knew that the expenses, so we had better guidance moving forward so we would not make um, expenses or charge things that may not be allowed under the federal pr principles. Um, you know, Treasury did their additional review and we have since repaid all of the dollars that have been requested of us to repay. When did your agency decide to return those funds to the Treasury? Excuse me? Why did your agency make the decision to return those funds to the Treasury? For the, the, for the initial amount, we actually had made the decision prior to the release of the report for some of the, for some of the expenses. We had reviewed it and recognized some of those were questionable and we, we were better off to repay than to, again, debate each and every fee. The other fees we repaid in March um, following the exit interview with Treasury, we paid an additional $5,100 at that point in time. Uh, have you received any guidance or training uh, to your agency uh, received from the Treasury on the use of administration funds? Have you had any kind of correspondence or any kind of guidance from the Treasury? We, we have received guidance over time uh, from Treasury at different points. Um, they, they were in our office, um, uh, I think it was five times over a seven-year period uh, with on-site reviews. Uh, the administrative expenses were not um, an issue at any of those reviews. They have since provided some additional guidance uh, regarding the uh, federal principles. And again, those have been what we reviewed and, and instituted across the board for this program. So their primary communication means uh, is just visiting on-site? Is there any other ways they communicate with you? No, it's regularly with staff, um, with the staff that are administering the program, regularly communicate through emails, through uh, phone calls, conference calls. Um, as issues come up, they would bring that to the attention. There's regular calls with the hardest hit fund states as well, where information is communicated out to the group. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. James, uh, summary of questions and topics there. Would you like just to take a, 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 maybe 30 seconds and kind of uh, maybe going back to those same questions, give a summary of the of what I was asked of Mr. Farmer. So yes, sir. The um, SIGTARP report disclosed that there was $705 in misuse of funds, and we, of course, did not agree with that. But we did, um, after the Treasury report, reimburse $397. Um, the funds were used concerning um, hardest hit activity, lunches, um, promotional items for some homeowners. So we did not consider the funds to be a misuse or unnecessary. What were some of the hardest hit fund implementation challenges, Mr. Farmer? Mike, please. Uh, some of the difficulties were the, um, it's an, it was a relatively new program. We had a small scale program in the state, but receiving the dollar amounts, it required us to basically start from scratch. Um, as I mentioned in my remarks, we had to hire uh, staff. Most of those were contractors, temporary contractors. We knew this was a time limited program. Um, so we, we, we tried to go out and, and hire and at our, our peak, I think we had 50 contractors that were working on the program. Uh, we continued to maintain that same staff. Uh, it was a statewide program, and, and you know we've got a very, really large state with 100 different counties. We had to work with partners across the state. Um, we held events as we were rolling out the program. We had to educate all of the partners on what the program that was going to be, and then figure out a delivery vehicle to get that out to the homeowners. 
Um, it required, you know, we built a in-house, we built a, a database system to for the portal, uh, as we refer to it, for intake of the applications that not only our partners but also homeowners had the access so that, you know, whether they were computer savvy, they had that ability. If they needed to go to a counseling agency, we made sure they knew there was a counseling agency available. So it was really just the size and scale of the program initially um, and knowing that there was, um, there was a great need and it was not an area that our agency had a lot of expertise in. We're used to providing the affordable housing as opposed to saving the affordable housing, but it was a challenge that we took on. It was something the state needed at the time and so we were glad to step into that role and it certainly has been a learning experience for us. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chair, thank you very kindly. Um, Ms. Romero, um, we've got some information indicating that, um, the, that your office, the Office of the Special Inspector General, um, found information that led to uh, four criminal charges against 415 people and 349 criminal convictions with 247 people sentenced to prison. So that's not just taking the office out for lunch, but what kinds of activities were taking place there? And is this just in the hardest hit fund or is that in TARP overall? Thank you for that question. TARP overall, so 100 of those are, are bankers. Uh, a, a good number of them are their bankers, co-conspirators. Co so we're talking about bank fraud. There's about 88 people who've gone to prison for scamming homeowners in, in TARP housing programs. So there's a, there's a, a number of things related to the, the crimes that we're looking so at. So the kinds of waste, fraud, and abuse that you identified in the hardest hit program afflict the other programs under TARP as well? Well, I think the, in terms of the TARP housing programs, we've found people who've tried to scam homeowners. Um, the other ones are sort of program related, like bank fraud related to TARP banks. Okay. So, Mr. Kremble, let me come back to you. Um, but, you know, there's some suggestion that Treasury, if not washing its hands of what goes on at the state level, is somewhat indifferent or lackadaisical about it. Is that right? I mean, do you basically just trust the state authorities to implement this in an efficient way with integrity? Uh, Thank you for your question, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. We, we work with the states and have conducted more than 100 uh, in-person reviews. We I can't speak to what SIGTARP's uh, methodologies that they use are. However, ours are, our, our reviews are incredibly detailed. We look at uh, uh, each expenditure to make sure that they're complying. Have with you followed through on all the recommendations that were made by the Special Inspector General that came out as part of her report? There are two reports that are outstanding and we're still reviewing, but every uh, other than those two, we've replied to each line item recommendation that uh, the Special Inspector General has provided in writing and that is available to the public. When you say you've replied to them? Uh, we, we, have, we have written a response letter with each uh, line item. Right. But I mean, of course, what we're interested in is terminating the underlying practices that are wasting uh, public resources that should be going to people who are in need. Right. We, we certainly are appreciative of that and are very focused on making sure no waste, fraud, or abuse occurs. We follow federal cost principles along with every other federal program. It's a it's yeah. standard. I mean, I, I guess, you know, you detected some frustration in Mr. Connolly's response to you, and but I also detect a certain kind of passivity about the enterprise that we follow the principles and we stand by the law and so on. I mean, one expense that I think would make some sense is to bring all these people in from the 50 states to have a big meeting and say, here are the principles and here's what's going to get you sent to jail. And we're very serious about enforcing this because it's the public's money and it's people who need it. And I'm just curious about what kind of high octane intensity you're bringing to the task of enforcing integrity within the system. Sure, we have yeah. annual, uh, several, several, uh, have had several annual um, uh, meetings to share best practices and, and certainly review compliance procedures. Any time there's an instance of uh, called into question, we work with the states to, to augment those and, and to strengthen their internal controls. Uh, with respect to Ranking Member Connolly's question, uh, the federal cost principles allow for uh, uh, for, for healthcare platforms for employees of, of the, of the and health and wellness programs, and, and gym memberships do fall under that. Okay. Um, Ms. Romero, do, do you feel confident that Treasury has uh, responded positively to your recommendations and is implementing them in order to crack down on the waste, fraud, and abuse and get the money to the people who need it? Well, I, let me say I, I do appreciate that there's been some movement, but no. 
Um, this, is a, this is an absolute misread of the federal cost principles, which start with one, necessary, as to what Congress intended, two, reasonable. Uh, three, allocable to the program. So when it comes down to accountability, if you really want to stop what's going on, let's just first start with repayment, because there's no better way to deter future misuse of funds than repayment. And then let's put some controls in here. But uh, looking just because the federal cost principles have a line in there about health and welfare does not mean that gym memberships or health and welfare things are actually necessary in what Congress intended, and that is being lost. Yeah. Um I mean, I would just like to say the expenditures that are reported here are kind of eye-popping, and I think you know any government agency would be amazed to think that they can spend money on you know lavish Christmas parties, taking people on trips, even just purchasing lunch for the office on a daily or weekly basis, that kind of thing that we saw. I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. Um, well. Um, Look, the, the, the program arose because there was this terrible crisis that threw millions of people out of work and millions of people lost their homes, and the, the focus is on that. The big banks got uh, essentially this huge subsidy, but we still have a lot of people around the country who are hurting and are in crisis. And so, uh, you know, I guess the, the last point I want to ask back to you, Mr. Granville, um, are you convinced that you've got the controls in place right now to make sure that the money that's still within the pipeline is going to be spent in the right way? And do you have the controls within Treasury to make sure that you guys are on top of it? I appreciate your question. We are uh, very dedicated to working with this committee and SIGTARP to make sure uh, in each state, each, each program, to make sure that they are following the uh, proper uh, federal cost principles that, that waste, fraud, and abuse are minimized, if uh, not eliminated outright, that the uh, intended use of dollars uh, from the, that Congress has set forth will be followed, and that the real driver of this whole platform is to help homeowners in need, and we are committed to doing that, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now um, recognize myself for a few questions. Mr. Cramble, you're, you testified that, there, that you've expended $8.8 .8 billion of the uh, $9.6 billion. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So you only have $800 million left in the fund? That's a large number, but yes, sir, $800 million. Yeah, that... Uh, that is a large number, but, uh, but but it also indicates that the program is virtually shut down. It is in wind. It is wind down. We have less than one percent of all dollars of from TARP, a four hundred seventy-five billion dollar program left to deploy. Yes, sir. Miss Romero, is that number consistent with what the IG has found? Well, that's what has left the U.S. Treasury, but the money's not been spent. So, if you think about it this way. When we investigate fraud or when we audit waste, those are only of spent money. The money's protected. There's $2 billion that's left unspent in the program. So there's still $2 billion out, but there's $800 million left in Treasury. I just want to make, get that straight. Yeah, for, me, for my purposes, this, whatever's sitting in Treasury is nice and safe and secure. Whatever is out there and it's going to be out there in the future, which is $2 billion, that's what I've got to watch out for. What responsibility, Mr. Cramble, do you think the Department of Treasury has for ensuring that uh, over these last few years that this money was spent uh, to achieve the, per the stated purposes to, to help families who were homeowners keep their homes? Well, there are several, several uh, uh, measures taken to make sure that the dollars are spent. Um, no, I'm asking you. Not on the cost. This is not a filibuster time. This I agree. is I want to know what responsibility does the Department of Treasury have when, when you're overseeing a program like this to make sure that in this case administrative costs don't get out of hand. I mean you, you do have an oversight responsibility. Certainly. Uh, from a from a cost from a administrative cost perspective, we, we, we work with them to each state to look at their uh, internal controls. But more importantly we're working with them to make sure that dollars are being deployed. If they're having a challenge, we're working with each state HFA to make sure that uh, that they are their their platforms are accessible to those who need it. Well, where was Treasury when you had people uh, driving Mercedes or renting office space in the Taj Mahal or 
I mean, I, I, I really appreciate the work of the Inspector General, but generally, if the Inspector General is coming to call, the report is not always a good report. And that's, that's unfortunate, but it is indicative that there is a problem with oversight. Sure. And Treasury has responsibility here. And I don't like the idea of us having to have hearings like this and then coming back and trying to fix a problem that should never have occurred to start with. So I just want to know, does the Treasury take seriously its oversight responsibility to make sure that the people at the State level who are handling Federal dollars, taxpayer dollars, are not abusing those dollars? Certainly. We, we actually are, are identifying many of the items that SIGTARP has identified ourselves through our work, and then we refer it to SIGTARP for their review. But we are very focused on that, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, tell me what action has been taken. Has anybody been fired? Uh, has anybody been referred for investigation uh, for, um, you know, criminal issues? There, there are many cases where we have required the states to replace them, uh, their management teams to make sure that, in the case of Nevada, for instance, we worked with their uh, HFA to ensure that proper uh, accountability was occurring and, and that the... He was forced to resign and paid $20,000 in severance. I mean, for crying out loud, is there anything that, that he could have done that would have gotten him fired? Sir, as we reviewed each situation, we offered our recommendations and... Let me ask question of the folks who administer the programs from the State level. Did Treasury provide any guidance or training to you or your agency on the use of administrative funds? Did you, did you attend any kind of training online, in person, FaceTime? I mean, did you get any training? I know uh, this is Varese in Nevada. Because of the way I was brought on, uh, I was in constant contact with Treasury. Um, prior to me coming on, I, I did read correspondence where Treasury and SIGTARP both, as well as the Housing Division, had expressed some concern. Uh, Nevada's situation... But you didn't get training. You did not attend a training session. I, I mean... No, Treasury actually, I came in the door with training because I was walking hand in hand with Treasury because okay. I came in after the problem was discovered. All right. How about you, Ms. James? I wouldn't say that we received training. We did receive guidance via the um, the agreement that we signed. But in terms of FaceTime, it was always discussed at our summits. But training, per se, I cannot say that. How about you, Mr. Farmer? I would agree with Ms. James. That was the same. That was Mr. Romero. Is that a problem? If you're being, if you're charged with handling hundreds of millions of dollars, is that adequate training? No. Um, let me ask you this. Um, on Ms. James, you guys had uh, $35 million uh, for demolition, and um, you repurposed $34 million of that. You spent a million of it and only demolished three houses since 2014. Um, I hope you didn't spend a million dollars on it. Uh, because I think for a million dollars, I could have gone in there with a sledgehammer and a wheelbarrow, and in a four-year period, Mr. Rask and I probably could have done that and would have gladly done it for a million dollars. What do you think, Mr. Rask? <laughs> no well, doubt. <laughs> uh, that that drives me crazy. Uh, I, I prior to this job, I ran a think tank and I also worked in the private sector, and uh, in an engineering uh, couple of engineering companies, and I had my staff do a little research for um, the Birmingham area and the average cost of uh, um, to completely demolish a house, it, it ranged from five thousand for a smaller home to fifteen thousand. At fifteen thousand, that's sixty-seven houses that should have been demolished for a million dollars. Now, uh, uh, if you want to look at the median, ten thousand, that's a hundred houses. What uh, you demolish three houses? Let's say that's forty-five thousand dollars. Let's say they were the toughest ones to take down and haul off. What happened to that other nine hundred and fifty-five? thousand dollars. The state of Alabama does have allocated a million dollars to the blight elimination program. We have actually only dispersed $38,000 for those three properties that were demolished. So you have got 962000 in balance? Correct. That is correct. 
All right, on that, I'm not going to get into what the local responsibilities are uh, for, for those houses, but I would point out that if these are homes that were previously owned and, and the mortgage is defaulted on and there are tax liens on them, which is typically the case, I know in Birmingham there are at least 16,000 abandoned buildings, there's 25,000 or so in Jefferson County that have tax liens on them. Is there any responsibility that the local municipalities have or any opportunity for the municipalities to take ownership of these homes and dispose of them? We have worked very closely with the City of Birmingham as well as their land bank in terms of trying to get them up and running on our pilot program for the blight elimination product that we were offering. We reached out for the pilot program to two cities that we knew were in great need of assistance. We reached out to the City of Mobile as well as to the City of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. The City of Birmingham did submit an application, although the application was never completed. Um, we have not heard from them. Our last conversation with the City of Birmingham was January 29th. We had conversation with um, their new, a part of their new executive committee. Um, they do have a new mayor in the City of Birmingham, and Mr. Roberts did reach out to us, and we had conversation with him in January, but we have not had a response from his office. One of the problems that, uh, potential problems that I see uh, in, in some of these programs, particularly the demolition, is that the state agencies ensure that there is uh, uh, an open bid process for, for that type of work uh, so that you don't have a single source contractor, no bid rigging, no brother-in-law contract sort of thing. Uh, Ms. Campbell, I'll start with you and we'll just go in order. Are those, uh, do you have those insurances in place? To, uh, your, are you in, would you be actively involved in, in monitoring uh, the disbursement of any money to make sure that, that, that there was a fair and open bidding process? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, the uh, SIGTARP released an interim report where they identified a weakness with our policy and procedures. Um, when I came on, um, it was like restarting the organization all over again. And we, although we got multiple bids, we did not fo follow a, a, a specific RFP process. And that was one of the takeaways that we took back after SIGTARP recognized that, is that we're taking a look at all of the policy and procedures and seeing how we can tighten them up. Well, Ms. James, considering only three houses have been demolished in three years, I don't think that's an issue yet. But uh, when you do start expending that money, I, I highly encourage that. Mr. Farmer, do you have a, a, an oversight uh, program in place to make sure that, that contracts are fairly bid? Well, we are not actually operating a blight program. That's not one of the ones that we run in our state. Will you? Uh, no, we do not have an intention to run a blight program at this point. Okay. Uh, Ms. Romero, in your investigation of, of how funds have been handled, you've been looking at the administrative costs. Have you also had an opportunity to look at, at uh, not just the uh, blight programs but other areas where contracts have been let? And do you have uh, any insight into whether or not these are getting adequate oversight? So in my opening statement, I identified one of the top threats as anti-competitive conduct, and we're actively conducting audits and investigations. And I will just say this. Our investigations are criminal investigations run by special agents at SIGTARP. They are confidential. So I'm not at liberty to discuss those, but I will say it's a real issue. It's a real issue um, in this program. I want to go back to you, to Mr. Cramble, and I'm... Um being a little generous to myself in the, in the time, but I think this is very serious. Um, I think we all take this seriously. Uh, the thing that disturbs me more than anything else, and this is particularly true in Alabama, Ms. James, that there were people out there who, who lost their homes, who w were eligible for this program, but uh, only 24 percent of Alabama uh, Alabamians were able to, to get help from this fund. That's the third lowest in the country. And it, it looks like uh, new homeowners were given preference over existing homeowners. And, and from my perspective, the whole point of the program was to help people who own their homes to be able to stay in their homes. Um, we don't make a distinction in Alabama versus new versus existing homeowners. Our program is open to applicants who have um, suffered a hardship prior to their application of the program. We do have a significantly high withdrawal rate of applications. But, but that that's is because the, pro the process is so 
impossibly complex and cumbersome. We I mean, it's some of the same things that Ms. Romero has already testified about uh, in Georgia and other places. Uh, what's the national average? Wasn't it like 80 something percent of the new home first new homeowners got approved? Yeah, you're talking about the down payment assistance program. Yeah, yeah that's like that's like 88 percent. 88 percent compared to like national average in the 40s for homeowners. Yeah. Well, we're in the wind down stage of this program, but from my perspective, particularly in Alabama, it was a failure when two-thirds of the people who needed help couldn't get help. For whatever reason, that's a failure. Um, Mr. Cranville, I want to go back to you. Um, do you, have, do you. How does Treasury go about monitoring uh, these programs? I want to get back to the oversight. Well, I, I want to make it clear that every identified case that, uh, of, of waste, fraud, or abuse We've reclaimed every dollar that was. Um, but you only reclaimed four hundred something thousand dollars out of three million dollars. Sir, I can't speak to the the standards that the others have reviewed. However, at Treasury and our program at HHF, we have reviewed each one, and and we've reclaimed each case. There's a case that did not meet federal cost principles. We can't just decide. Although things might sound improper, we have to have a standard, and that standard is the federal cost principles that we follow, sir. And every time those have been violated, the dollars have been fully reclaimed. So none of these things, well, I won't say none of them, but it, it, it took SIGTARP bringing this before you to identify this. That, um, my guess is, is you didn't provide this to SIGTARP. SIGTARP provided it to you. Uh, I can't speak to each case there. There are, I, I suspect, cases that were provided to SIGTARP. However, we undertake a sample-based program that is risk-adjusted in terms of how we uh, pursue uh, our, our reviews. So we do a sample study. I will tell you that less than one one hundredth of one percent of all administrative dollars have been deemed improper per the federal cost standards. How would you respond to that assertion, Ms. Romero? So there's like more than eight hundred million spent. I haven't audited all of it. Nothing's been provided to us from Treasury. But again, it's like not seeing the forest through the trees. I keep hearing federal cost principles, and it starts with necessary. And why necessary? Because under appropriations law, you got to get back to what Congress intended with TARP. So yes, there might be some statement about rent as being allowed, but that doesn't, you still got to look at the program. Is it necessary for the program? So if in Nevada, they're really not letting people into the program, moving into a luxury building, it's not the same. I mean, it, and so that seems to be lost. The, the context of something seems to be lost, getting back to what Congress intended. And I want to say this, when we, when we apply the federal cost principles, this is not like a, a, an IG shop going out on an island. There is years and years and years of GAO and other IG reports. We're just, this is just bread and butter work for an IG shop. This is not going, doing something that's somehow remarkably different than anyone else. This is just really, really basic, get back to what Congress intended for spending. Well, I'm about to gavel myself, but um, I just want to say this. this. One of the reasons this really, really bothers me is that um, we sent out $140 billion in improper payments last year, and it'll be more than that this year. And when you, this is, Obviously not in, in that realm, but it all adds up. And every dollar that is improperly expended, every dollar that's wasted, every dollar that's misused is a dollar that we've had to borrow and that adds to our interest burden. So I guess my concluding remark on this is, is that you have got to do better, and we're going to insist that, that you do better and that the state agencies receiving federal money do better. With that, uh, I uh, recognize Mr. Grothman, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, for five minutes for his questions. Right. Uh, you guys have about $2 billion left in, in the TARP or overall in your program. Is that right? Is that what we have here? Those are the unspent funds. Correct. Um, these but what year was this program originally established? With 2010, 2010, 2010 yes, sir. 2010. Um, what do you plan on having happen with that $2 billion? 
So to be clear, the $2 billion is uh, the amount that was appropriated uh, is an extension of the program. Congress extended the program through an additional $2 billion in, in uh, 2015 with dollars made available in 2016. They go out to the states to be spent uh, at the state level uh, deciding how they should help homeowners uh, most. Um, given that, I can't really heard this on the news this morning or whatever, um, the housing market is booming, I don't know, right, nationwide. I mean, in general, housing costs are up everywhere. Do you think it would be appropriate to take these funds back now or, and, and you know, kind of what the chairman said, vice chairman said, uh, give them back to the treasury? Is, is it necessary that we help anybody else in this program? Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, we at Treasury are administering a program put forth by the Congress deemed necessary, and, it, and if the states are unable to use those dollars at the end of 2021, they will be returned to Treasury in the uh, our, uh, What would happen if we grab the money now? There, my understanding is there would have to be a change to the federal Right, right, right. If we would change the law. We would change the law and say we're not going to send any more money to the states. What bad thing would happen? Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, states are utilizing dollars they believe are needed. Uh, if they cannot use them, they will return them. But well, well, we're broke, uh, kind of getting back to what the chairman said. We're broke out of our mind, okay? Now, I know if you send money to states, they will always find a way to spend it, ultimately. But, I mean, the question I have is, given that the housing market in this country right now is booming like never before, I am told, um, do you feel it is necessary to send any more of these many more of these dollars to the states? What would happen if we didn't? What would happen if we'd say we're we're taking them back and we're giving them back to the treasury or whatever? Mr. Vice Chairman, I think that question might be best for the states. We are solely uh, allowed to administer the program you've set forth for you us. You can't make any observations on the program you're administering. I, it's your your point, mind is a blank. To you your point, sir, the states have found plenty of uses for the dollars. Just out of curiosity here, there's a, there's a general lack of urgency in this whole building upon spending federal dollars. D does anybody on the panel know what percent of uh, the federal budget we're borrowing this year? Just out of curiosity, we have five informed people here. You want to guess? Ms. Campbell, what, how much of the budget do you think we're borrowing this year? We'll call on you. Mr. Vice Chair, I do not care to guess. Thank you. Nobody's going to 22%. That's kind of high, isn't it? Twenty-two percent. I mean, you know, we gotta. Um, okay. Well, we'll give you some questions here that are prepared. Um, which state housing finance authorities report perform better than others, and what do you attribute their success? Uh, well, Mr. Vice Chairman, I would say that the states have utilized the the dollars uh, most quickly, have performed the best. States like. California, uh, Florida. Uh, however, their performance is really probably best gauged over time, and history will decide that, sir, after the program is completed. Define success in these programs. We've helped more than 350,000 homeowners in, uh, in, in demolition and in, in green 24,000 uh, blighted properties. Um, I'll give a question to either one of you who's got a a housing finance authority. How would you describe the goals of the hardest hit fund in your state? I think the goal for North Carolina was to try and help as many folks as we could <clears throat> during the economic crisis and recognizing that there was a real challenge with the high foreclosure rates that were not anything we had ever seen before and trying to help as many families as we could. And help and them how? Help them out. Um, in in our case, there was a number of different programs we operated. The primary one was the was the uh, mortgage payment, um, where we would make their payment while they were um, out of work or had reduced work, uh, and while they were being retrained retrained for their job. So it was basically getting them back on a good footing, bringing the mortgage payment current, um, getting them back to where they could uh, remain in their homes. Okay, I'll ask you because you're from North Carolina. What bad? Do you have any money out there? I, you're still operating, obviously. 
What would happen if we took back all the money that hasn't been spent right now to the federal government, our broke, our poor, broke, destitute federal government? If you, if you took that, back the money, we would basically have to shut down the program sooner um, than anticipated. Right now, we anticipate uh, closing it out the second quarter of next year, so we would have to close it out you know, at whatever point that the state recovered the dollars. So it would, what would it would amount to would be fewer households that would uh, benefit from the foreclosure prevention. How are housing prices in North Carolina right now? Uh, they're doing really well. We're, we're a growing state now, um, so obviously the economy has turned around. If housing prices were booming like they are in North Carolina in 2010, would they ever in a million years have thought up this program? No, sir, I do not believe they would. Right, right, right. We'll say the same thing. Uh, Ms. James from Alabama, do you want to, if I gave you the same questions, what would you say? Um, we definitely enjoy the use of the hardest hit funds in the state of Alabama. We have helped several homeowners actually maintain home ownership. If for some reason the funds were withdrawn from our state, I do believe that there would be some people that would actually go into foreclosure. There has been a turnaround in our state, but removing the funds would cause some families to actually go into foreclosure. How are housing prices in Alabama? Housing prices are well, doing well in Alabama as well. If housing prices were booming like they are in Al now in Alabama like they were in 2010, do you think ever in a million years Congress would have begun such a program? I would have to agree with North Carolina. I don't think so. It's more than enough time, so I thank the chairman for giving me an extra 20 seconds. My pleasure. Um, I thank the gentleman for his questions, and I'll recognize the ranking member, Mr. Raskin, for follow-up. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kremble, but um, I wanted to come back to something I started off with that's still bugging me, which is um, wh why is Maryland not part of this program? What about the states that have been left out? D does hardest hit refer to the states or does it refer to the people who were the victims of the downturn? Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, the decisions on what states were eligible to participate in the hardest hit fund were made under a set of criteria developed by a prior administration. If you would like, my team and I would be happy to come in and sit down with you and run through those criteria and, and talk about the other programs that Treasury has well, that are helping the state of Maryland. Well, are you actively reconsidering those criteria? Um, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of money that's being wasted in other states, and maybe it's not necessary there, but we've got parts of Maryland that were just devastated and demolished by the crisis. So, I mean, is that something that's under active consideration with you? We do not have authority to change the, the criteria at this point, sir, that, that changes are uh, to which states are eligible. Are, uh, are Why not? not? Uh, the the uh, criteria was set forth, the program is closed to. Uh, but it's a matter of administrative discretion, right? It was not, it was not built into TARP itself. Sir, I'd be, uh, I, I can't answer that specifically. I'd be happy to work with my team. And well, you, and do, do you know of a Supreme Court case called Shelby County versus Holder? I do not. But in that case, the Supreme Court said um, it basically cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act because different states were being treated differently. And here's a program that has been set up by the Department of Treasury where some states get the benefit of it and other states are completely excluded from it. And... You know, if there's billions of dollars that are sitting around that still haven't been programmed, I would like you to reconsider why all these other states, including my own, were roped off from it. Uh, Vice Chairman Raskin, my understanding is that legislation required that the funds had to be committed by, the, by um, October 2010 for the eligibility. Again, that was a prior administration. We can go through that with your office uh, and my staff, if you'd like, sir. I, I would love it if Treasury would present us a, a legal memorandum analyzing whether you've got the authority to include the large parts of America that were excluded from the program. Um, so, but yes, I would very much appreciate that. Um, let me just ask you one other question, Mr. Campbell, and then I, I want to go to Nevada for a second. But, but, but whose job is it to coordinate and oversee the hardest hit fund within Treasury? Uh, we have our Office of Financial Stability, which uh, administers the, the, all of the TARP programs, including the Hardest Hit Fund. And as far as oversight goes, they report to me, and uh, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, 
uh, for small business community development and affordable housing policy, and then I report to the Assistant Secretary for, for Financial Institutions. So the, the name of the office, again, is the Office of? of financial Institutions. Of Financial Institutions, okay. And so, the, so is there a director of the Office of Financial Institutions? or Assistant Secretary. Assistant Secretary. And who's that person? Uh, Assistant Secretary Christopher Campbell. Christopher Campbell. So is he the person who's really in charge of it on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, or, sir, the or, program is administered by the Office of Financial Stability, and their uh, chief financial officer uh, is day-to-day -day working with the overseeing the team. I, what I'm trying to get the sense of is, uh, is this somebody's job at Treasury where they're focused on this massive program, you yes, know, sir. with billions of dollars to distribute, or is it just part of somebody's portfolio of... We 10 or 15 different things they do. We have a team that is specifically focused on this program as well as uh, other, this uh, hardest hit fund program specifically. And then there's also a team of um, overseeing the overall TARP programs. Uh, we have roughly 30 folks who oversee the platform. Okay. Um, so. Administer the platform too. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the buck stops where ultimately, if something goes wrong in the program, who within Treasury is the person who says, we really need to make big changes in Nevada, or we need, you know, we need to revolutionize what's going on in Alabama because the money's not getting to the people. Who, whose job is that? Uh, that, would, that specific job would, be, would fall to our hardest hit fund team and program director for that. And then that would be elevated to say, we want to make you aware of this. We are going to recommend a change. For instance, in the state of Nevada, a new program was just put into place in April of this year to make sure that those dollars are spent properly. Okay. So let me come to Nevada, Ms. Campbell. Wait. Now, I understand you're part of the new regime. You're not part of... The, the people under whom there was a lot of waste and fraud and abuse, but to what do you attribute the problem that plagued the program before you got there? Thank you for the opportunity to answer that question. I think there were multiple issues that I identified right off. The first thing was that there was really no systems in place that would create a strong foundation to administer such a program. I mean, the program was massive. The second thing was staffing. Uh, there were people, they had a great resume, however, they came from the banking industry, and I think that's where some of the, the misunderstanding of how to interpret certain uh, guidelines came in. Uh, they, they were coming from private sector. Uh, and then also, I Wait, think... Would you just elaborate that point? You mean they were accustomed... You're, you're talking about, like, the gym memberships and the, yes. the free freewheeling spending and so on? Yes. For example, I'll take lunches. Um, and I think for one of ours, there was uh, a staff member who was pregnant, and they bought a baby gift. Well, that might be appropriate if you're in private practice, but it's not appropriate... Under in government, guidelines. everybody kicks in their $10 or whatever, right? That's how we do it. Right. But you're right. saying they were just writing checks. Right. I, I think that the there was just a complete misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And then also, as it's demonstrated here today, there's certainly a, a uh, I guess, a difference of interpretation between SIGTARP and Treasury. It would be most helpful to the states if we had some some uniformity there. So, I, I mean, even coming on, it was difficult. We hired a CPA firm as well, and we get this large super circular, and it's left to interpret, so. Okay. I, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank the ranking member. Um, Ms. Romano, I'm going to give you the last word on this, and I'd just like to hear from you about um, what you think we need to do from this point on. Yeah, I think there needs to be greater accountability and greater controls. I mean, I, 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 I went up and, and I just, you know, I met with Secretary Mnuchin and he said, you got to recover all this money. And I said, look, we don't recover it, that's up for you. And then I met with Treasury General Counsel. I think people in Treasury need to sit down, they need to reread the federal cost principles and they need to look at the first page, which says necessary. And it goes beyond, we can talk about federal cost principles all you want, but it comes down to appropriations law. Federal government, you cannot spend money unless Congress authorized it. That's what it all comes down for. And so that's why the necessary provision can't be left out. 
And they need to go back and read this memorandum by their own general counsel. They need to go back and take a look at all of this. Because what I've not seen in Treasury's work papers is that, determina that determination about what's necessary. That idea that if in California, hundreds and thousands of people can get this help with, without, without this kind of expenses, without lunch every week, or it, it's not necessary. And so if you go back and look, Secretary Geithner said, much to the chagrin of a number of congressmen, can't use this money for legal aid, can't use it for broad housing counselors. But we know a lot of people get into this program through legal aid or through general housing counselors, but you can't charge it. So if you can't charge that kind of re reasonably related, because it's not necessary under appropriations law, then how can you take those same housing counselors to the zoo? So I really, I understand uh, when you, that, that Treasury is saying, well, there's a provision in these cost principles that say this, but you gotta read page one. You gotta read page one, which says necessary. Federal cost principles cannot uh, override appropriations law. That's what it comes down to. So what I think everyone should do here, all the state agencies and everyone in Treasury involved, let's get back to what did Congress intend in the TARP law and what is this program for? And it doesn't matter whether something's related or reasonably related, that's not the standard. Do you have to spend the money? And what I also suggest they do is they talk to each other and say, California, you're not spending anything on this. Arizona, you're not spending anything on this. Other, other state agencies, not spending anything. And they talk to each other and say, are you, are you using this money for bonuses? You know, I think that's where accountability comes in, is really all it, all it is about is getting back to what Congress authorized. And if they do that, and if they talk to each other and they work something out, then I think it'll be back on track, but there's got to be controls in there. It shouldn't be just left up to each state. Well, my concluding remarks on that is that, first of all, you have to take seriously what Congress intends. That's true of every federal agency. And I don't, if, if Treasury doesn't take it seriously, then the state um, agencies may or may not take it seriously, but very likely they won't even know what those criteria are. That's my whole point about the lack of training. I think tr when the Treasury or any federal agency is overseeing money that is sent down to the states, there has to be uh, a clear understanding of the parameters within which that money can be spent. Now, some of the money, as Mr. Raskin pointed out, and, and that of others have pointed out, were spent on things that, that anyone with any common sense would have known that if, that if it wasn't just plainly wrong, it was definitely in the gray area. And I think Treasury has a responsibility to monitor that. That's an oversight responsibility that, that you have. And what I'd like for you to do, Mr. Cramble, is, is uh, uh, when you get back to Treasury, I'd like for you to, to submit some changes to the, uh, some suggested changes for the guidelines. I think on our end, as members of Congress, we, we've got to be more diligent in making sure that, that uh, our instructions are clear, that when we're hemorrhaging uh, funds like we are with deficit spending, uh, we can't afford to, to, to waste another dollar. So with that, uh, I just would say there seems to, in my opinion, there seems to be a lack of seriousness and commitment to help the hardest hit homeowners uh, keep their homes and, and, and to uh, prevent those abandoned homes from becoming blight on cities. And we can't, I don't know what we can do to go back and fix what's already been done, but I guarantee you we're going to pay attention to what happens going forward. And, uh, and, and I think, Mr. Cramble, that Treasury needs to inform everybody of that. I think the Inspector General uh, Sigtarp has, has done a good job on that, and I think they'll be happy to, to, to let you know when those things are getting outside the lines. With that, I thank our witnesses again for appearing before us today. The hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit a written opening statement or questions for the record. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittees stand adjourned. <laughs>